and you are now live, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, welcome everyone to the Harbor East Marine Drive Community Council for uh, Thursday, the 7th of January, 2021. Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, first of all, let's do a roll call as he was present of the members of uh, Community Council. Start off with uh, district number three. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, district three, Becky Kent is here and uh, representing all of the good people of district three. I'd like to offer happy new years to everyone um, and thank them for all the contribution that they've made to so far Nova Scotia being in such a good position and much to be proud of here on so many levels, but in particular COVID. And I actually, I'm going to take, put a little shout out for all of us also as politicians in the world today. Uh, I think we've uh, we've got lots to be proud of here in Nova, in, in Canada, uh, it's certainly in Halifax. So um, happy yeah. new year and I look forward to a successful and productive 2021. Yeah, we stayed in Blaze's home, we didn't travel. <laughs> <laughs> District 4, please. Good evening and happy new year, everyone. Uh, Trish here from District 4 and um, ditto Becky. <laughs> Thank you. District 5, please. I'm here, Mr. Chair, and uh, I have to say, Councillor Kent's background is just lovely. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> it's a lovely shot of Eastern Passage. Yes, it, it is. really is. Okay, Council, uh, District 6, please. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I think we're all glad that 2020 is gone. However, the first five days of 2021 uh, were good until yesterday, which uh, another reason to be thankful where we are uh, in the world. Well, hopefully the American bureaucracy and the politicians have their own epiphany in regards to how democracy is supposed to work. Anyway. I believe we have a plethora of staff also on hand. Perhaps we do a quick roll call. Okay. Who's president of the staff? I'll start uh, as our solicitor president. Hi, <clears throat> Claire Gillivan with Legal Services present. Thank you. Our program manager of regional planning. Catherine, is Catherine with us? Uh, is, uh, don't hear her yet. Is Maggie with us? Maggie is not with us this evening. Okay. Thea, is that your voice I heard just heard? It is, Councillor. Thank you. Thea Langel. Thank you. Mr. Vipon, you present? Present and accounted for, sir. Thank you, Shane. Uh, would Mr. Steve Higgins be available? Steve is not attending this evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have Simon, uh, our Ross Siegel, our legislative assistant, and uh, is Liam on the line with us tonight? I'm right here, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Is anyone else that I might be missing that's on the line? I see Carl Purvis is on, on the line with us. Councillors. Hello, Councillors. Hello, sir. And who else? We got uh, Michael Pierce with us as well. And uh, I think that's everyone. We have April, of course. April Stewart's with us as well tonight. Hi there, Mr. Chair. Okay, so I think that's everybody in the staff I acknowledged. Okay, next item on the agenda is the uh, approval of minutes of the special meeting of December the 16th. I have a motion to accept them, please. So moved, Mancini. Moved by Councilor Mancini, seconded by. I'll second. Uh, Councilor Purdy, Trish. Councilor Purdy uh, seconds the motion to accept the minutes of December the 16th. All those in favor say aye. 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 No one opposed. The motion carries. The order of uh, approval of the order of, of the business, the approval of any additions or deletions. Do we have any uh, members? Anything to add or delete? Thank you, Thank you Mr. We Chair. Have a motion to, we have a motion then to approve the order of business. So moved. Oh. Moved by Councilor Mancini, seconded by Councilor Purdy. All those in favor of the order of business, say aye. 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 Motion carried. No business arising. Any declarations of conflict of interest today? Hearing none. Uh, no motions of reconsideration, no re motions of rescission, no deferred business, no table, matter, uh, table man matters. 
Uh, so we have a public hearing, case number 21813, a partial rezoning of PID 414-539-45 Cal Bay. We'll have uh, staff make a presentation. Perhaps, uh, Becky, you want to put the motion on the floor first, and then we'll have the presentation. Yes, I can do that, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll move that Harbor East Marine Drive Community Council adopt the amendments to Schedule A, the zoning map of the land use bylaw for Eastern Passage Cow Bay as set out in Attachment A, and request a staff <coughs> identifying <coughs> of increasing environmental concern around the Cow Bay Lake area, including the setbacks, sorry, setback regulations of Cow Bay Lake and, and the Barrier Pond, a discussion on the existing P2 community facility zone, and the range of permitted uses within the special area designation of the MPS for Eastern Passage Cow Bay. So moved. And seconder, please. Council Purdy. Thank you for Aye. a second. Okay, we'll have the staff presentation, please. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Board. Chair, members of Council. I assume that uh, the uh, clerk's office is going to go ahead and put up the staff presentation. That's the queue for the uh, clerk. Right. Uh, staff had uh, initially planned to uh, provide the presentation, uh, but I can. Um, uh, I've got I've got the presentation here, so okay. no problem. I can run it from my end if uh, if necessary. That's uh, if that's more convenient. Uh, uh, I propose we can we can go ahead that way. Okay. Can everyone see? Yeah. Yep. Everyone yes. can see? Okay. Um, so this is case uh, 2181 3. Uh, it's a proposed rezoning from P2 Community Facility Zone to RA Rural Area Zone. The applicant is Akistic's plan and design. You can see from the location map that the area uh, of the subject of the rezoning is in is red. Uh, the purpose of the rezoning is to construct a single unit dwelling. To provide some context, this is located in Cal Bay, off of Cal Bay Road, fronting Cal Bay Lake within proximity to Silver Sands Beach and the Moose. Uh, there's a slight plateau, it grades towards the water course, Cal Bay Lake, uh, and there has been uh, much vegetation and forestry that's been removed from the site, um, but you can see that it grades towards the lake. Uh, it's quite picturesque, a very nice property. Here you can see that there is a dotted line that represents a 100 foot setback relative to the proposed rezoned area. I'll speak about the significance of that in a moment. Moving on, uh, the policy overview is such, uh, you know that it's an RA rural area zone, uh, P2 community facility zone, but this is an area in which is designated special area. SA10 of the Eastern Passage Cow Bay Municipal Planning Strategy is the principal policy. Now, when I speak to the special area designation, there's some fairly um, emphatic language around the notion of the retention of environmentally and historically significant area or land. And to this end, there have been a number of initiatives with respect to the widening of frontages over time in order to reflect that desire to maintain the low intensity uh, nature and rural nature of this area so that those environmental protections remain in place. However, SA-10 is relatively specific and strongly worded with reference to council shall, shall zone lands which are held in private ownership for the purposes of preventing low density residential development. And staff feel that the application of the RA zone is appropriately uh, consistent with this intent. I'll speak more about the use, uh, the land uses within the RA and P2 zones in a moment. Now I want to step back and, and talk a bit about the application history. Uh, when it initially came in, staff looked at this and concluded that if someone other than the applicant, say on adjacent lands, were to come forward with a similar request, we would go through the same analysis in order to determine whether the P2 lands should be appropriate for a re uh, rezoning to RA. 
And on that basis, we expanded the application to include all of the P2 lands in that immediate area. And that's what is reflected on, on the website, uh, the HRM website. However, after the public information meeting in January of 2019, um, we heard from the community a number of uh, issues with respect to environmental concerns and decided that it was most prudent to uh, return that scope to the original request and only focus on the subject property. Now to that uh, public engagement feedback framework, which was held in January uh, 2019 by way of public information meeting, a number of things came out from the community with respect to environmental sensitivities. Of course, the impacts to Silver Sands Beach, Cow Bay Lake and area, the barrier ponds were front and center. But one of the, uh, the main issues were that the water levels and storm surge might make a building site inappropriate if it was closer to the water. In addition, there is some concern over the reduction of the setbacks that uh, from the water course, the ordinary high water mark that had occurred due to a mapping area, area when the 2006 regional plan was adopted. So uh, we'll talk more about all of that in, in a moment as we go through. Getting back to the public information meeting, you can see that uh, 165 uh, notifications were mailed out, 61 attended, but there's been a lot of uh, activity online, over 1,000 web page views of this particular issue. So um, I want to talk a bit about uh, comparison of the RA and P2 zones as it relates to the policy framework that is inherent or that is within the uh, Eastern Passage Cow Bay MPS. And I'm really referring to the protection of those environmental and historical uh, land use, uh, this historical nature of this area. So when we look to the RA zone, it's a fairly low intensity use, innocuous use with respect to, um, to the generation of impacts. You could see potentially forestry and agricultural uses, not practical in, in any location around here. It's essentially a low impact and I think consistent use um, relative to the policy intent. When we look over to the P2 zone, however, we see things like fire and police stations, government offices, you know, uh, community centers, uh, hospitals and medical clinics, uh, things that um, would, would typically be permitted in the P2 zone, a, P2, a zone that is actually located within the most sensitive environmental area uh, in, uh, along the water course there. So, this is a bit of a concern for staff. We, uh, we are making the argument that the RA zone is more in keeping with the intent of the MPS than the P2. And um, so we're going forward on that basis. So uh, that is the rationale for the recommendation of approval, essentially, is that the rezoning to a low density residential development is more consistent with uh, the environmental and historical significance of this area and that the RA zone is less intensive than the P2 uh, permitted land uses. And I, I think staff can make a strong argument there. Um, in terms of the areas adopted by the 2006 regional plan, it was a mapping area that actually, if you think about this from 10,000 feet up, the, the prospect of, of uh, enabling a policy as wide as the, the 2006 regional plan covering every inch of HRM, there are bound to be a few errors and omissions. Unfortunately, this error, uh, this error um, resulted in the reduction of the setback from the whole ordinary high water mark from 200 feet to 100 feet. And that's unfortunate because of the environmental nature, uh, environmental uh, mandate uh, to preserve these lands um, uh, within, with respect to uh, the nature of environmental land use or, or land uses. Anyway, uh, location of the lands in the proposed rezoning, however, are located at the original 200 foot setback. So I want to just um, draw your attention to um, the mapping that occurred earlier. You, see, you remember the red uh, area. Well, the limit of that down towards the water courses is, is 200 feet away, irrespective of the 100 foot setback that is currently in the bylaw as a result of the mapping area. So they've uh, they've been consistent with the intent uh, to move that 
those uh, that land use back. And what that does, um, if one considers the argument of the P2 uh, being more intensive than the RA and therefore less consistent with the MPS policy, um, is that it disincentivizes the development of the intensive uses of the RA um, on that most uh, sensitive environmental area. So what I mean to say is that you've got a 100 foot setback from the ordinary high water mark. If this application is approved at the 200 foot limit, then there's only 100 feet of developable area in there, which essentially renders it, uh, um, uh, it, it truly disincentivizes the development of these of those lands and I think is more consistent in terms of the intent to preserve. So staff are recommending that council uh, rezone this portion of the R of the P2 to RA. Um, but further, it is acknowledged that there is some work to do here with respect to looking at um, that was list of permitted uses in the special area designation. Uh, right now, uh, from a legal standpoint, you have to cross RA lands to get to the right of way from the P2. So we have to determine whether or not that's even viable. Um, and that is a, that's going to be a big job in and of itself, but we have to look at the setback regulations and to fix these errors that uh, that occurred with the adoption of the 2006 regional plan. Um, one of the key issues around the Cow Bay Lake is to determine uh, what the status or classification of that lake is, whether it is brackish and a, um, a, a fresh water body as uh, reflected in a Supreme Court decision in 2007, or whether it is indeed coastal and defined as ocean, in which case another measure would apply. Um, that is a, uh, a coastal elevation requirement as opposed to a setback. So those are things that uh, we would bring forth as part of the staff report uh, and we seek that through the recommendation this evening. So uh, we request the council approve the rezoning to uh, or recommend the council approve the rezoning to the Eastern Passage Cow Bay LUB in accordance with attachment A of the staff report and we uh, suggest the council request a supplementary report identifying the issues of environmental concern for the Cow Bay Lake area um, and discuss that P2 zone that I referred to earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions of uh, councillors to staff? Uh, I do. Councillor <laughs> Kent? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um I have a few. Uh, thank you. I want to start by thanking um, the staff for the work that they've done on this, and in particular as well the presenters. I want to again um, thank all of you on council and <laughs> for my the contact that I've had after the last meeting where I asked for reconsideration at, uh, on the scheduling of this hearing. It was important to me that being uh, relatively new to this particular case, <clears throat> that I had the opportunity to really fully discern uh, what has been sent to me. Lots of information has come forward, have a chance to understand what's at play here and uh, be more comfortable with uh, the, the consideration of everything that will come forward tonight. So um, I want to just thank you for that. And it's uh, important for me that I had that time for the benefit of all of District 8, but in particular for Cal Bay. So um, Shane, is it OK if I call you Shane? Yeah, of course. <laughs> OK, Shane, uh, so I just want to understand to make sure, is this application uh, restrictive? Because the RA zone offers a number of things that could be built there, but is this application in any way restricted to the single unit dwelling? Because whenever the report references, it says this is for a single unit dwelling. So, but the RA zone allows for a few other things, right? Oh, the, uh, that's correct, Councillor. The, uh, the full list of the RA uses would be permitted um, in an RA zone. Yeah. So uh, it, the intention is to 
build a single unit dwelling, but uh, but yes, all of the RA provisions would apply. So mobile home, mobile dwellings, bed and breakfast, home uses, forestry uses, agriculture uses, fishing and and fishing related uses. So Correct. so there's there this one this application does not specifically restrict to only a single unit. No, we uh, as a matter of course, uh, you cannot place conditions on a rezoning. Mm -hmm. as opposed to say a development agreement where you can establish specific land uses. Right. So uh, so no, the full suite of land uses would be permitted. OK, um, a lot of what's come forward to me has been around the uh, environmental impact on erosion and flooding and the impact on flooding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and there's been a lot of information. I know that a lot came to you, but uh, from well during the election and, and uh, since there's been a lot more to digest and sort of you know, work my way through. Just so I understand what's being said here, the the on page two under proposed details, it speaks to in the first paragraph. This rezoning will allow a single unit dwelling to be built closer to the shoreline of Cow Bay Lake than what is currently possible based on the present location of the zoning boundary. Now, we have uh, your presentation suggested that there is a uh, you landed on a 200 foot setback can you can you tell me the dynamic of of why this was spoken said in the report and then the 200 setback set foot uh, setback of 200 feet i'm just i'm just feel like there's a gap there for understanding i feel like as well in the report there was a a comment about that was the the the, the flooding concerns and and the setback um, and this is this present uh, location for the zoning boundary and, and how close it is to the water was worked out with the proponent. Is that correct? Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Mr. Vibhant. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I didn't realize. Uh, so uh, that's correct. The, uh, the proponent uh, uh, did choose to move the zoning boundary back to meet the 200 feet. The uh, if the RA were applied by permit without the rezoning, obviously the, the uh, single unit dwelling would only be permitted up in the RA area, which is quite a distance away because uh, they're asking for um, quite a substantial distance towards the water, but not within 200 feet. So, so to say that they're looking for development of a single unit dwelling closer to the water is correct, not on the water, not within the 200 foot setback. Okay. okay. Right? So it still meets that standard that is in place uh, for. Um, right. Becky, Beck, your five minutes are up. I'll let the vote on the council come back to you. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilor Mancini, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Shane, as always. Very good. quick question I have is I, I'm not clear on is the uh, P2 community zone. Uh, I understand what it is, but in your motion, you're saying along with the environmental concerns to uh, get a supplement report. What do you mean by having a discussion about the P2 community zone? I'm not, I'm not clear on that. Uh, you're not recommending we go that way. You're just you're leaving the door open. Can you explain that to me? No, I, what I'm looking to do is uh, what I suggest is that the P2 zone with all of its intensive list of permitted uses is somewhat inconsistent with the general intent of the municipal planning strategy. Now, one has to remember that this evolved in layers over time, certain, uh, and what I, I seek to do is come back to council with a supplementary report establishing how that we arrive at uh, these set of conditions today. Because what I believe is that the P2 zone is relatively inconsistent with the intent to maintain environmental historical significance. So the question is, is it appropriate to remain in that state? given those conditions. I mean, it's not that I think that in practical terms we'll see a hospital down by the water course anytime soon. The problem is that it's enabled. And so um, the question is, should that be remedied? And, um, and so a, enough of the community has raised environmental considerations. We see it as an issue. We see the setback certainly as an issue as well as the, uh, the error, the mapping error. Um, so we, we think it, it needs to be 
uh, dealt with appropriately. So when you come back, Shane, you'll be coming back with some direction at that point in time on that. Yeah, I think we seek to to bring forward an initiation report. Um, this appears to have policy implications, so that initiation report to go, would go to regional council. But uh, that's the the request right now from staff. Okay. That makes it much clearer. Thank you very much uh, for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Mancini was on the same thread that I uh, that I'm interested in. Um, the, uh, the 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 P two zone there. Does that does that um, does it apply to more than just this specific area? Like, is it in use elsewhere um, in the Cal Bay Eastern Passage area? It is, but it's not in use in a special area designation. That's okay. the distinction here, because uh, because of that environmental historical significance. So okay. it's like, um, it, yeah, okay. Okay, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, it just seems a bit of an odd situation to be allowed to have a house on a property if you have a daycare in it, but then if you don't have the daycare, you're not allowed the house. It seems seems like an odd zone. Um, I'm guessing it dates back quite a ways. Thank you. Got it, uh, Councillor? Yes. All right. Yeah, uh, any, other, any, any other questions of any other councillors? Councillor Kent, do you have any further questions? Yes, I do, Mr. Chair. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, does this motion um, address and um, I guess uh, validate or um, reflect the many points of consideration that have come forward to staff well before this around the erosion and the and the environmental impact and all that. Like, do 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 are we are we coming forward with this request for that report, um, acknowledging that a lot of the community passion and the community input has been beneficial and has had an effect mm -hmm. and that can be we can be working towards uh, a positive change correct some errors etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I think so councillor i think um what we would seek to do is engage that community through the supplementary process uh, which i should also mention that as part of the supplementary process we would look to tap in to the provincial um postal protections process to see where they are um, relative to our timeline here and to see what uh, what they have planned. And the other thing is with respect to uh, the classification of that water course, because it has an impact with respect to uh, whether or not you apply setbacks or you apply close to elevation provisions. And right now, um, without opening a, a can of worms, there is a Supreme Court decision that has identified this as a brackish fresh water body, therefore setbacks apply. But I would like to have the opportunity to engage the community with all of that and have their input. And of course we have um, issues with respect to our relative responsibilities to the province and what the, and the fe federal government with respect to their jurisdictions. But uh, you know, in terms of what we can do on land, I'd certainly look forward to engaging the community. Thank you and that was part of question is could you explain to me what that would look like and would my original question was would you be engaging with community because there's a tremendous amount of resource within our community who have data and have information have knowledge have historical knowledge have have reports and theses and etc cetera, etc cetera. there's a lot of good data out here and 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 whatever we do in the future whether it's through this application or through other planning reviews and such the community are uh, often they're experts on the things we should look at. Uh, not always necessary, not always experts on the detail behind what we are going to find. Sometimes they are, and a lot of good data has been brought forward, so that's good to hear. Um, and so I think you just remind me of what that could look like. I just want to make sure I understand that, and and for uh, yeah, understand what when you say engage. Um, I want to make sure I understand what that would look like. Well, I think uh, there are certainly some stakeholders in the immediate area that have expressed um, a strong interest in becoming uh, and having a say in 
development in that particular area and have indicated to us that we have some concerns with respect to the tides and uh, so we would we would certainly engage them. I don't know right now with the COVID protocol how that looks just yet. We'd have to think about that internally. That being said, um, it, you know the, the challenge always with this type of thing is, and I just referred to provincial and federal jurisdictions and what we can and cannot do under our umbrella. There, there are always limitations. So I think part of what I seek to do is educate the community in terms of our land use provisions and what we can ultimately implement and provide and do the best that we can there um, and hopefully they can then become involved in potentially the provincial initiative which is the uh the coastal protection act i mean we can we can tap into the staff but it might be a number of years away so uh, I, I know that there are some keen community members out there that are interested. I'm interested in hearing from them. So we'll uh, we'll do our best. At the end of the day, I think this will be initiated by regional council. It'll identify a scope of work. Um, what staff will do is leave the resolution um, general enough that we can explore and adopt things that currently we may not understand today. Yeah. And I think that's important because at the end of the day, there may be some information from the community, as you say, that uh, that may be germane and may be within our purview to adopt. And so I think that's that would be staff's focus going forward. And, and that will be reflected in the supplementary report um, if council chooses to, to move in that direction. Mr. Chair, do I have, a I have one more question? All right. Well, you've been a lot of Okay, so um, your comment about it could be this, if, if, if it goes in this direction tonight, uh, your comment about uh, could be years away because of the provincial uh, layer. We know that there's a regional plan review coming up that would include some review uh, engagement. There is the rural suburban plan after the center plan that's coming up. Um, uh, the master plan I suspect would be involved by, by law. Um, amendments potentially in layers and layers. Is there work that could come forward in those that could help um, uh, influence any of or, or or what's the how am I how do I want to say this? I have no idea how long it might take for a supplementary report to come back. We are still we know the regional plan uh, review has some interaction coming soon. Uh, or at least this year, I think is this year, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is there any work there that would potentially impact the work, the, 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 the what we're, what you're putting forward today? Uh, or that cer certainly, certainly. Uh, let me clarify something. Uh, I, I was only suggesting that the Provincial Coastal Protections Act may be years away, not the conclusion of this planning okay. process. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, We've already had discussions internally about um, being consistent with the regional plan, including energy and, and environment folks to weigh in and to vet all of the issues that are part and parcel of this. So we're, we're looking to be consistent with that effort. Um, the timelines for adoption of this particular process don't necessarily need to be uh, <laughs> concurrent with the regional plan, given the timing. <clears throat> but we want to make sure that we're consistent in in our recommendations going forward. Um, the study of this process will ultimately determine its outcome. So um, it is a standalone process, but I, I hope to connect with those other departments or those other uh, folks within our department. OK, I think that's it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh... Councillor, I, I just have one quick question, if I may, in regards to the historical significance of the properties. Uh, my recollection calls from history that the sand and gravel operations at this particular area were used to rebuild the hydrostone, to build, to make the hydrostone blocks and rebuild the hydrostone in North and Halifax after the explosion. As well as I recall 50 years ago, as a little kid in the neighborhood, um, the concrete zoo that used to be on the beach there. There used to be a bunch of animals in concrete form there, and I remember the crocodile in, 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 in particular. 
but I'm just kind of curious, though, uh, will the supplementary reports try to bring in this history and perhaps in a way to, 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 to have it interpret panels or discussions of that? And also, with the discussion of Silver Sands Beach, will this application have anything to do with the access or opportunity for an alternative access to the beach? Will that be, will those be topics of discussion in the supplementary report? Because I know it is controversial, the, sand, the Silver Sands Beach, and will this applicant yeah. be one uh, aspect, but could their access to Cal Bay Road provide no possible alternative access to the beach? Um, thank you for the question. So <clears throat> with respect to the first part, certainly we can look at, uh, dig into the history a little bit. We, we know that gravels were taken from Silver Sand Beach uh, in, more recently to, to deal with infrastructure needs within local area, not just in areas abroad. So uh, that, that uh, beach continues to rebuild and it shifts like all beaches. And that has been uh, an issue that's been raised uh, from locals in the area. We've, we've listened intently to that. Uh, certainly we can look at um, in, including a portion on the history through the report or uh, at very least through the, the larger study. So I think it would be germane. With respect to the alternative access, uh, this process is not part of that initiative. That initiative is, is part of, uh, of something that's ongoing outside of the planning process. So uh, that's not to say that if they wanted to meet with us and to discuss it, uh, certainly we would listen. But in terms of the study, our scope, uh, which will be um, certainly directed to regional council and will be specific, um, will we'll speak primarily to the P2 land uses, um, the setback provisions, the uh, coastal elevation issues, and the protections that are consistent with the intent of the MPS. And uh, that is the focus, not necessarily obtaining alternative access um, to Silver Sands Beach. That would be done separately through another area of HRM. Okay, thank you. Uh, no other further questions of counselors. I'll uh, then go to the public hearing. I've been advised to read the following. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for the public hearing for case 21813. The order of events uh, for a virtual meeting will be similar to a regular public hearing. We will start uh, with the staff presentation, which we've done, give the applicant an opportunity to present uh, via telephone, and then go uh, to the public hearing speakers list, uh, we, uh, which we have two people signed up. Uh, it is a reminder that, uh, that all speakers, that those uh, watching from home in order to have been signed up as a speaker. The deadline was 4.30 p.m. Uh, yesterday. Uh, I have the finalists before me and those two names I'll read out later uh, in the order they'll be speaking and that will be uh, Tracy Faulkner and Bill Faulkner, from, both from Cal Bay. Uh, speakers are to remain uh, on mute until your name is called and once called you um, can unmute your phone You'll have, a, you'll have five minutes to speak, and once you have completed your uh, comments, we'll please remute your phone, and then uh, either listen to the conclusion of the meeting, or you can leave the meeting by hanging up your phone. Uh, these meetings are webcast, and you can view the rest of the uh, proceedings by the link uh, on halifax.ca. So, uh, having said all that, uh, do we have the applicant uh, with us tonight and they wish to speak on this matter? Or representative for the applicant? Uh, just a reminder that if um, uh, there are members on the phone that are having difficulty unmuting their phone, they can unmute their phones by pressing uh, star six. Star six to unmute your phone if you're on the line. Do we have the applicant or representative of the applicant on the line with us tonight? There is a representative for the applicant here. This is Rob LeBlanc. Hello there, Mr. LeBlanc. Happy New Year to you, sir. Happy New Year to you all. You have five minutes, sir, to make your uh, plea to the council. Sounds good. Uh, well, thanks for the opportunity to chat. And Councillor Ken, thank you for your comprehensive questions. Um, I did want to just kind of uh, give a little bit of background to this. Uh, project. This was uh, when the applicant purchased this property. 
it was one very large pit. In fact, there was plans uh, when I was a younger man for a golf course on this property. And there was, um, the, the site has been bisected by two zones. Um, not sure how that line was, was drawn uh, originally, but it seems fairly arbitrary. But uh, as Sean mentioned, uh, you know, the water side seems to be a much more intensive zone with the opportunities for hospitals or fire stations, but also the opportunity to develop a single family home uh, so long as it has a daycare use associated with it. And I think what the applicant is looking to do is just to, uh, rather than have two zones bisecting a, a property, which most planners try to avoid, uh, when when the uh, larger portion was subdivided into a series of smaller uh, lots to be developed as single family homes, uh, this is one lot that's a fairly large lot that is already restricted uh, by a wetland and the 30 meter setback, uh, which compromises what you can do along the Cow Bay Road portion. Uh, you're fairly limited in size. And so the rezoning request is merely uh, to ensure that this, this one PID has a single zone associated with it uh, and that it's able to develop a single family home and uh, with a little more flexibility on where that can be developed because of uh, where the wetlands located, which um, restricts um, the development parcel along Cow Bay Road. So I think, you know, we're looking at uh, a, a really quite simple request here um, for a less intense use going from P2 to RA uh, to allow for a single family home. And I'll, I'll just end it there and I'm here to respond to any questions. Thank you. Is there any uh, questions of counselors to the applicant or representative of the applicant? Any questions from anyone? I see none, and I'll open the uh, public hearing uh, for those who have been signed up. Tracy Faulkner, are you on the line with us tonight? Tracy Faulkner, please come forward. Star six to unmute your phone. Mr. Clark, do we know if we have the Faulkner's on the line? I do see the um, the uh, phone number provided, so I'll just uh, remind uh, if um, uh, the speaker uh, is is able to hear. I'm sorry, I'm still here. There we go. Okay, sounds good. Go ahead. Is this uh, uh, Tracy? Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, um, respectful councilman and HR planning. I um, appreciate that it's been probably a, a very uh, you know, a lot of uh, community engagement. So I just wanted to touch base and, um, you know, be the voice behind, uh, you know, the, a passionate community member. Um, I had something I wanted to talk to you, but I will be honest that the first slide where it talked about community engagement and things from that perspective. Um, so uh, just wondering, because when I was looking at the first slide and it indicated the emails that you received, can you confirm whether or not you received uh, documentation from a member of DFO who spent his career researching uh, the beach movement and the impact on storm surges and noting that a one in a hundred year storm surge um, is something that's kind of non null and void since the 1992. Also whether or not you received an email from a lady uh, from Ecology in Action who highly recommended that um, it not be developed whether or not you received an email from a member from the uh, team, sorry, the council team that created uh, the LUB for the Cow Bay and that individual described uh, why the P2 land was put into place and the reason um, why that P2 was there at that time. Uh, wondering if you had received the petition from the community members. Uh, at the time that it was submitted, there was 152 uh, community members along that direct strip that signed against the rezoning. Um, since then, I think there was a, an extra 20, but that wasn't submitted. Uh, wondering if you received an email from me <laughs> stating um, 
regards to the concern uh, as a long-term resident, 40 years, um, and now seeing the land storm surging and being completely submerged in water. Um, you know, that's for there. And I've also been sent further emails, carbon copied or um, actually forwarded after the time. So to see that not being included was very concerning, um, respectfully. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, if those things were looked into uh, and, you know, weighed, because I would like to hope that, you know, if looking at it from a holistic perspective and not just looking at what the developer submits, but also looking at what the community submits. Uh, I did want to talk also about um, the recommendation in regards to the uh, paragraph four on page five that states that it, the coastal elevation does not apply in this instance as the land is not deemed to be coastal um, as defended, defined under the LUB. However, on the map four that was submitted, um, environmental constraints, if you look at that map, it does identify in shaded area as coastal lands. Um, if you look up at the perimeter of the Cow Bay Lake is shaded and is gray, indicating that it is indeed the coastal land. Um, so again, that's a little bit of a discrepancy. Also wondering, um, you know, in regards to the Supreme Court case, I know that uh, what that land was deemed, or sorry, what that water course was deemed in 1919, 1924, and then in 1954 uh, was that it was not a um, uh, salt water and since then it has created after actually in the Supreme Court states that after 1954 it actually because of natural changes to the beach it uh, created inlet so if you go down there now you will notice that it is actually completely open to the uh, Atlantic Ocean so uh, another question is did HRM do any uh, water chemistry test to test to ensure that um, it is not <laughs> uh, indeed um, getting uh, water from the Atlantic Ocean. And then uh, lastly, which I'm probably squeezing in my five minutes really quickly, um, was, oh. One minute remaining. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, and I just want to go back to this whole uh, one in 100 because uh, we know that after Hurricane One, uh, most people in the Cow Bay residents will tell you that storm surges are occurring at exponential rates and it's not one in a hundred years anymore uh, where that term was coined. And further, uh, another question is, is that if this was to be rezoned, the abundant, abutting properties, what kind of process would they indeed have to follow? Um, because I believe that this is a bigger, uh, a part of a bigger picture. Okay, I, believe I will breathe now. <laughs> uh, thank you, Tracy. Um, and I'll just ask the clerk. We had uh, part of the presentation was a number of emails of correspondence received. I believe there's also correspondence received on the record tonight for this particular uh, case, as well as a number of other emails in the past, as well as I recall I do seeing the video that you had sent along about the storm surge situation. So I've seen all those and stuff, and I'm sure the, the clerk can verify they have also been received as a part of the record for this particular public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to confirm briefly uh, that uh, all correspondence received by the clerk's office uh, has been circulated to members. Um, uh, I believe it is uh, six items in this particular case. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Chair, is it is it in order uh, for me to ask if the staff have uh, the ability to respond to any of those things, or if that's that's not on the table anymore? That's the part I, I didn't know. Okie dokie, thank you. Okay, I'll have uh, Mr. Bill Faulkner come forward, please. Dad. Hello. Hello. Can I get this phone for him? You go. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman and Councillors. 
I'm not That's sure if I'm on mute yet or. No, you're, we can hear you, Mr. Faulkner. OK, um, good evening, councillors and uh, and chairman. Um, in the staff report under subheading of coastal elevations is a statement and a quote, uh, there may be a need for a developer to create elevation through fill or other means. Any plans to address the elevation would have to be addressed at the permit stage. Uh, it should be noted that there are several issues with that statement. Uh, there is no question the developer will have to create elevation by infilling of the wetland as this P2 land uh, area uh, floods from the south by the Atlantic Ocean and from the west by the Cow Bay Lake. This fact has been demonstrated to planning through uh, maritime coastal flood map simulations, uh, multiple videos and still pictures, and uh, the P2 area during uh, storm surge of the P2 area during storm surges and explained to HRM planning several times in the past that this flooding is an annual basis, not a, not a 10 year, a 15 year or a 25 year occasion. There is also a 3.8 meter elevation constraint that HRM planning cannot clearly identify what or how this constraint is supposed to be implemented on this land. It would be good if, if we could get some clarification on this 3.8 meter elevation. Uh, the intent of the MPS was to protect the low lying wetlands uh, areas from development. So my question for council, the first question, does this known flooding issue in the P2 area meet the threshold of EP2 in the municipal planning strategy as a safe area for develop development of single family dwellings? Uh, the second concern with the statement above, any plans to address the elevation would have to be addressed at a permit stage. I can speak directly to that statement as my property abuts this new subdivision. Uh, my property along with several others that abut one of the lots in this new subdivision are now flooding during heavy rain events and snow melt events. Uh, the developer increased the elevation on the property through infilling and the grade is in some areas as much as six feet above the natural grade that was basic and has basically created a dike around our lots. I wrote to HRM planning and explained the situation. Uh, HRM planning indicated that there is nothing they could do as the owner has not yet applied for a building permit. The developer can reconfigure the land as they see fit as HRM has indicated to me via email that they have little or no power to prohibit setback violations, grading alterations or removal of vegetation until the building permit has been acquired and the footings have been poured. It's interesting that after two years of infilling, the developer is still not applied for a building permit. I have also received an email from the engineering technician at uh, planning and development. And I quote, since the bylaws do not apply, uh, it is the responsibility of each property owner to exercise due diligence in preventing damage to their neighbors and the public uh, resulting from their property. Given the scenario I just outlined and the response from the HRM planning regards grade elevation being addressed at the permit stage respectfully, can council explain how HRM planning will address the infilling and grade elevation in one section of the subdivision with permits and residents who abut the same subdivision are having flooding issues um, and we simply can't get any uh, movement on this, this grade elevation to get the guy to reduce the elevation. Um, we've been told that there's no, no bylaws to apply so Basically, there's nothing HRM can do. Uh, so my concern there is, as you can well imagine, our properties now are flooding at the back based on escalation in grades because the land is in fact low land and it has to be elevated. Otherwise, it's going to be flooded. One uh, minute remaining. Yes. Okay, that's, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and Councillors. That's all for me. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Faulkner. Uh, since those are the only two that are signed up uh, uh, for the public hearing, that will be it for uh, any further input from the general public on this matter. Uh, the applicant now has an opportunity to respond to any of the uh, comments or rebut any of the points that were raised. So, uh, would Mr. LeBlanc, do you have any points you wish to raise or clarify from the, what you've heard tonight? Sure. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. 
great. Um, Tracy and Bill, thanks for uh, for calling in. And um, I, I did want to address an, a number of issues. I mean, the the issue of um, whether it's a freshwater lake and the movement of the beach, um, the lot that we're requesting the rezoning on. Uh, I think there seems to be a bit of confusion that that the current zone is a conservation zone or a holding zone and wouldn't permit development when in fact as Shane mentioned the current zone will permit a much more intense form of development than is proposed um, in this rezoning and um, I also wanted to mention that if you look at the zoning around Cow Bay Pond about 90 percent of it um, is currently zoned as either RA or R1 use and so we're asking for a rezoning to a similar use that is already already surrounding uh, this lot. The um, uh, 3.8 meter uh, vertical setback is what HRM has recommended the finished floor minimum finished floor elevation be uh, to uh, guard against any future flooding issues. So um you know that that issue is is already addressed through hram's current policies and as shane mentioned there the province is looking at uh additional coastal policies that can, could come into play in the uh coming years so again just back to the the simplicity of the request is uh we're asking to go from a, a more intensive use to a less intensive use um nothing to do with conservation Is that it, Mr. LeBron? Yep, that would be it. OK, thank you. Uh, may I have a motion, please, to close the public hearing? So moved. Moved by Councillor uh, Kent. A seconder, please. And Councillor Austin. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, say aye. 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 Motion carried. Uh, Councillors, what's your wish? Uh, we have an opportunity to for points of clarification or questions you may have to staff on what you heard uh, tonight. Uh, Councillor Kent, you have a question? I do, thank, thank you. I, I, I'm not sure that we got the, um, I got a good understanding of uh, some of the questions that Bill and Tracy put forward. Um, so I just was wondering if we could have Shane comment on um, this as well on this layer of the discrepancy of the coastal some this being deemed coastal and how that impacts this application. OK, so um, let's start back at the uh, 2007 Supreme Court decision. So I think everyone can agree that Cow Bay Lake is brackish and I think that's reflected in the Supreme Court decision. But on the basis of the I'm sorry. Of our, there's an, certainly the newer ones as well. Brackish is there is salt water in it. There is salt water in it. Despite okay. that, right, because there are flows in from the ocean, et cetera, and and that's reasonable and uh, and easily understood, I think. But I I think despite that, based on the Supreme Court decision, uh, or as a result of the Supreme Court decision, uh, which essentially classified Calgary Lake as a freshwater body. Um, the coastal elevation, the 3.8 meters, does not apply. Okay, it, so protections would be achieved through a setback to the ordinary high water mark. Hopefully, hopefully you understand. See, the 3.8 meter elevation is for the ocean and the ocean waters. But through the Supreme Court decision, this was determined to be a freshwater body. So the 3.8 meter as defined in the land use bylaw, therefore does not apply. That doesn't mean that the protections can't be achieved. They were achieved through the application of the 200 foot setback, which was ultimately divided in half on based on the mapping error that occurred with the adoption of the regional plan. Hopefully that isn't too convoluted, but that's that was the, the series of events. That's how it applies now. Um, and uh, so I, I know that there's this sense that the 3.88 meters shall, should apply. We'll explore that in the supplementary process. Um, but right now, as it's currently defined, those are the divisions in the classification. 
and so his ability. Sorry. Go ahead, Tapper. Is there an ability in the permitting stage to insert any of these elevation expectations? Well, uh, the permits are typically dealt with through the building of structures and they are administered through our development services on an as of right basis, as opposed to this particular hearing, which is a discretionary approval. So uh, just to clear that up, they have a number of criteria in their permit applications that have to be employed, such as grading and all, all sorts of things that they do through the building permitting process. Um, where this gets tricky is in the discretionary approval, when we're talking about the application of, of constraints that apply to lands that are in the federal jurisdiction. So I, it's not that I'm trying to skirt the answer. What I'm saying is it, during the, the permit is limited as well because we can deal with stuff that it's on land, but in terms of coastal surge, um, at the permit stage, there's there they are limited. Would they seek to um, apply a, an elevation? They would certainly uh, look to do that due diligence. Uh, yes, would it be 3.8 meters? It's unknown at this point. Thank you. Any other questions, counselors? If not, I have one in regards to the uh, lock grading and alterations and stormwater management. Where would that come into effect because the concerns of the elevation changes of the property as well as uh, redirection of water and possible flooding on neighbors? Yeah, it's um, so unlike a development agreement where we could employ that as part of the, the DA, the contract, that again is dealt with at the permitting stage in this type of circumstance. Um, the uh, As I mentioned before, you cannot apply conditions through a rezoning. So the evaluation criteria of the rezoning which was satisfied here, dealt with some of the, the higher level issues. But in terms of the permitting and the as of right process, should this ultimately receive approval, all of that is dealt with at, at, that, uh, at that level. Uh, Councillor Purdy, you had a question? Well, I'm, I'm new, uh, I do. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it was actually kind of related to your question there. And thank you, Shane, you are really helping me understand what I read <laughs> a lot more. Thank you. Um, it seems to be very reasonable for this uh, rezoning uh, because of the impact to the land. Um, uh, but in regards to the elevation at the permitting stage, that's where you can address this. So I think if I understood Mr. Faulkner's uh, concern about the infilling, filling, it, it's already affecting his land negatively. There's already flooding due to the elevation um, discrepancy that's happened prior to the permit being issued. So, would 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 his would we be able to circle around when the permit is applied for to to have that kind of as a caveat? You have to provide drainage or, or help to mitigate the flooding risk that has now become the neighbor's problem. Uh, due, due to that, like, it, will there be any onus of responsibility on the 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 landowner? Uh, sorry, Shane. I think you uh, may be muted. Shane, you're muted, sir. It's um, that's interesting. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Um. OK, a few limitations there with respect to this discretionary um, planning approval process. Uh, no, we can't go back and circle around to ensure through the discretionary approval that um, that issues of, of elevation are complied with. That is the job of the permitting process. Um, and they would do that because they have a list of criteria that deal with uh, those issues. Um, one thing is, though, when you're talking about grades and alterations between uh, to private property owners or private entities, it's typically a civil matter. So um, there's there's a limit where HRM's responsibility uh, begins and it ends. And uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. You have something to add to you? Uh, see, uh, see you're on, on, on screen and you have a comment to add?
I hear you. I heard you. No, nope, not drop again. Thank you. There was a little bit of a delay there on the unmute, so I do apologize. What I did want to just point out for Council, uh, further to everything that Shane has said, is that the new lock grading bylaw that was recently passed by Regional Council would apply to future development on these lands. Uh, so as Shane is kind of talking about the permitting process, uh, the new lot grading bylaw, to my understanding, would apply in the provisions with regards to stormwater management, erosion and sedimentation control, which has all been integrated into that new bylaw, would be applicable to this area. And that's part of the permitting process. Correct. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Austin, you had a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just wondering, uh, Shane, with the regard to the supplemental process that we are looking at, assuming uh, if we accept what's before us today, um, would we also look at, because uh, I'm not as familiar with the Eastern Passage zoning and I'm just, I've just been poking around, um, would we also be looking at, because from what I heard from the two residents, and I, I do recall the lengthy uh, submissions that came in actually prior to the holidays, um, would we be looking at as well, because I mean, what I'm kind of getting the sense is that there's some confusion as to what the point of the P2 zone is versus, say, the environmental conservation zone, which is just to the south of here, and even perhaps the floodplain zone, um, which if sections of property in this area are being routinely um, hit by storm surge. Um, is, is there an avenue to look at that kind of bigger picture? Um, as part of that process, we'll uh, we'll explore that. I think I think that's inherent in our mandate to look at um, what's what the suitable uh, application of land use regulations would be for that area. Of course, this is all data driven, so it would be uh, it would have to be data that's available and something that we could defend in the recommendations to the regional council and ultimately through to community council, but. Uh, but that's the intention, yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions of councillors? Are there any further questions? Hearing none, uh, we have the motion already put on the floor. Um, so uh, I'll call for the question. Question. All those in favor of the motion, play up, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I have, I have a question of order here. Do I do I have an opportunity to speak to whether or not I want to support or okay. give you any opposing remarks? I, I suppose we got a little ahead of ourselves. Yes, you, you can. Yes. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, counselors. Thank you, Sam, for nodding your head so <laughs> fervently. <laughs> you knew what I was going to ask, didn't you? Um, uh, so, yeah, I do have something to say here because you know, uh, this is important to our community. This is important to District 3. And uh, first, again, again, I want to thank everyone who's taken part and, and thank the counselors for giving all of this. There's a lot of detail here. Um, I, I do believe that the detail and the consideration at the staff level has, has absolutely been extensive and thorough. Um, due diligence has been given to public engagement. I do have some concerns around uh, some of the asks around some of the receipt of, of these um, emails and, and, and submissions and videos. I know I've received a lot of them and have had the opportunity to review them. Whether or not they were all there is something that uh, is something to give consideration for the next time where we have the opportunity to, to, to for constituents to reach out to their counselor and make sure that that, you know, they, that the things have been received that they think are important. Um, the community has absolutely done their part here and I want to acknowledge that they have done a lot of work to put forward their positions and it's not been just this this now it's been over the course of a number a few a few years and we need to make sure that that all is taken into consideration on this application I take it seriously I know counselors you do as well and and uh, we want to get this right we, we are restricted to um, to how we can correct some of the errors of the past and the uh, but I wanted to make sure that that you understand counselors and the public understands that I as the counselor for this area are certainly committed 
to making sure that the Cal Bay residents and the community are able to work through processes in the future. Whatever decision is decided tonight, we know there's opportunity coming forward to address a lot of what has been put forward and it needs to be addressed. Um, to clarify and correct and update the, the planning uh, strategy and land use bylaws in this area, as, as I'm sure they are across HRM. The, um, this application allows for single unit dwelling, but it also allows for a few other, other uh, types of, of, of development. Um, what's standing out to me or what sort of is the rub for me and where, I'm take, where I will take this position is the, 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 the change from being what I consider to be fairly significant in a P2 zone to what would be less extensive in an RA zone. That, that, that holds weight with me. It has to hold weight with me because nine times out of 10, those are the things you're constantly as counselors, we're making decisions about what is that greater impact that we're being asked to offer. It's usually the opposite that's coming this coming forward before us. So that has a that has that, that weighs heavily for me. Um, you know, I have an obligation and, and as do the other counselors to carefully consider the interests of what the constituents are saying, but also equally the the bylaws and uh, the policies that are in place um, and whether or not this is consistent with them. That is the biggest thing that's at the table right now. There's a lot of things at play for the Silver Sands Beach area in Cow Bay. There's so many opportunities as well for HRM to bring support to the table to acknowledge the significant historical interest and information for the area. What um, I want to just share, and I know I don't think we're supposed to bring props, so I'm bring one anyway. This is a huge document, and this is a thesis that a local yeah, uh, young woman has produced in her um, bachelor's of Atlantic Canada studies, Megan Hudak. She produced a, an amazing document that I, I would, I really want to make see, want you to reach out to me if you want to learn about Eastern Passage and Ca particularly Cow Bay and the Silver Sands area. Take a read of this. This is amazing information. Gives you the historical data from first first voice. It gives you from gives you technical information from uh, experts. And it, it gives you a really good understanding of what's been at play for, for Silver Sands. Um, I'm talking about this because I really want to acknowledge and, and to um, sh impress upon you as counselors who will be helping to make this decision why there has been such uh, a, an intense amount of information that's come through on this application around coastal erosion, the impact um, on the environment, the concerns that and and equally the opportunities I think that are before us on future considerations for this area, whatever that might look like, including uh, David. Thank you for Councilor Hensby. Thank you for uh, bringing up the access to the beach and 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 such. It um, it is all a, co a complex complex of things. It's a <laughs> it's a complex area that's got a lot uh, contributing to what can be done, what was done, where the future is. But I want to take a minute to uh, talk about um, what Megan was able to put forward and share. And Councillor Hensby, you did a little bit. But in the 1800s, mid 1800s, this beachfront was a destination. This was the go to place for visitors from all over the province and including the eastern states, uh, United States uh, visitors. Gazebos, imagine this, gazebos canteens, uh, women in their with their parasols walking the beach and in their in their cost, their bathing suits of the era. Um, imagine the the community residents as they were growing up. Um, Mr. Faulkner's family, uh, they, there's the Hudak family. There's there's just so many the Mosiers when they were growing up and being able to go down to this beach that was that was beautiful. Um, with canteens and gazebos, corporate parties, you know, uh, combing these white sands and enjoying the sunshine. It was a playground and it is worth commemorating. This Silver Sands Beach area is has got to be framed in this context for HRM in anything we do. Um, later, these fantastic um, uh, statues that 
Councillor Hensby also mentioned um, from Win that were developed by Winston Bronham on the beach. There is currently only one left. At least a depiction of it is the the moose that's been referenced, and um, it's an important icon of the community. The mid 20th century silver sands um, made with uh, contributed to HRM the building of HRM by the removal of sand and gravel, and it was significant. Uh, I was not aware of the of the place that it took um, the the contribution made to the hydrostone, but the it, it created and built the foundation of Shearwater Air Force Base, the Heartland Point Battery that's down here where the golf course is, um, and I believe some of it as well went to, into the McDonald Bridge foundations. So I share this information again to fully acknowledge and uh, the passion of why people are here talking about these things. Um, uh, there's a lot of misinformation or I guess confusion of information I think out in the public around what we can legally do tonight as far as uh, with the, the oath that we took and the, and the responsibility that we have for the public interest, for consideration of every, every all, all the factors, but ultimately to fulfill the policies as well. Um, what I see is that the work that the community has done has spearheaded the second half of this motion that's now before us. And I think this second half is almost more important than the first half. The, per the first half is, I think, uh, it, it's it, as the proponent has put forward, it's, it's and, and Councillor uh, Purdy mentioned it, it just seems, seems like it's a straightforward answer on this. Um, but the contribution of all that was sent in from our community has has spurred on that that second mo part of the motion to make change. We need to ensure that while progress is going forward and it will go forward, there is progress is going to happen. Change is going to happen in our communities. Um, we need to though we need to update and review and correct errors of our past, uh, correct um, inequities and and um, uh, just discrepancies, I should say in how these plans that we have going forward are reacting and, and um, affecting each other. Um, and I, we need to do that so that we can honor this incredible history that I think is a hidden gem that so many don't know about. Uh, I wanna again thank Tracy and Bill. You've done so much, so much to, um, to facilitate a really positive impact. I want you to be aware of what a positive impact you have had on this issue. Uh, particularly around that, that second part of the motion. I do expect that I, that I may not be popular with everyone in this meeting when I would tell you where I'm sitting. Um, I do hope that everyone would consider helping to work with me and with our community to bring positive and, and concrete and safe um, uh, support structure to make sure communities don't have this convoluted situation that is at play at Silver Sands Beach with there's federal, there's provincial. I mean, we're going to have that in many areas, but I think that errors, when errors are made, it makes it that much harder. So we have to be very careful with that. I think that um, from a community perspective, you're right on track with raising the whistle, blowing that whistle on a lot of things that are at play. And I thank you. Um, so uh, I'll finish up. Uh, with, um, after careful consider consideration and certainly deliberate consideration, I believe that uh, this motion has to stand, um, which means I have to support it. I cannot, I have an obligation, I cannot identify a reason that is within the policy that's at play now that would lead me to believe that the M that, that we're not um, uh, within the MPS um, and the policies that we have in place by accepting it and approving it. I want to say that, acknowledging that we have work to do. We have a clean, a mess to clean up and that I'll be looking for support from this council as we go forward and support from the community for us to work together and get this right. So thank you with that. I will ask that other councillors if they have anything to offer, feel free. Uh, Thank you, Councillor Kent. And I was almost going to suggest or remind you we're not in the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
we don't have the latitude of an hour to speak on an item. <laughs> But uh, I understand the compassion and, and, the, and the interest as well as the, the need to say what had to be said. Uh, are there any other questions of any other counselors or comments? Uh, all has one, before we call the question, can I ask the, our, legals, our legal or staff, if this motion should pass, are, what are, is there any appeals to these motions? And what process is that? Is it appeal to... Uh, to regional council or to the URB or what? Uh, just, want to have, just want to have an idea that the, the community knows uh, if this should pass, what alternative uh, issues or opportunities are there for the staff or for the public to perhaps oppose what decision may be made tonight? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, the, the, uh, a notice of approval uh, based on if council sh should move forward and approve this application. A notice of approval ad will go into the paper uh, for this Saturday. It is from that date that there will be a 14-day appeal period to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. So that is the recourse available to the public who wish to to uh, to view this application and uh, seek to appeal it. They would have to contact the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. Okay, thank you. Are there any further comment or questions? Hearing none, I shall call for the question again. All those in favor of the motion has been put on the floor. Say aye. 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 No one opposed. Motion carried. Um, so the next item of business is correspondence, petitions, delegations. I believe, Mr. Clerk, uh, you already alluded to the correspondence received to the preceding matter we just spoke of. Or were there any other correspondence circulated for other matters? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to uh, the uh, Community Council, there uh, is no other uh, uh, general correspondence at this time. Thank you. Are there any petitions, councillors? Hearing none and no delegations, and no information items brought forward, I believe we have no reports on the agenda tonight because uh, what I printed off is different than what's online here. Um, so there's no no reports to be brought forward for discussion. Uh, the in-camera items, we have the approval of the in-camera minutes of, of December 16th. We have a motion to approve those minutes. So approved. So I moved by Councilor Mancini, seconded by Councilor Purdy. All those in favor of approving the in-camera minutes? Say aye. 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 Okay, that's approved. Motion carried. No added items. Are there any notices of motion, members? Hearing none, our next scheduled meeting is the 4th of February. Hearing no other business to be dealt with tonight, I'll take I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by Councillor Kent. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, and once again, Happy New Year to our general audience. Thank Good night. You. Thank you. Have a pleasant evening. Good night, everybody. And thank you, staff, for your uh, time.